In this video, we're going to take a deep look into my 2021 Commonsell Clash Essential and go over both what I like and what I don't like about this bike. A lot of you have been asking for a review of this bike, but I wanted to make sure that I had enough time in the saddle in order to provide a thorough review. Well, I've had the time to develop my opinion, so let's start with the things that I like about this bike. Starting off with the piece that you guys ask about the most, this bike comes with a Fox 38 performance with 180 millimeters of travel, which is an absolute tank. Fox recommends a 15 to 20 percent sag on this fork, but I've been running it to the 20 to 25 percent range and have yet to bottom this thing out. Even when plowing through poorly chosen tech lines or nose diving straight out of the sky, oh. this fork has still yet to be clapped. One volume spacer came pre-installed, and so far that seems to be just right for me. The Fox Float X2 Performance keeps the rear wheel planted when going through its full 170 millimeters of rear travel. Since I'm not the most forgiving when it comes to riding my bike, I've used the full travel on this shock quite a bit. It's still a very playful shock that allows for quick maneuvering, but I'll likely throw a spacer or two for added bottom out resistance in the future. I've been running this shock with about 15% sag, which for me still doesn't prevent bottom outs. Any less sag than that just isn't comfortable for my liking. Speaking of comfortable, the stock WTB saddle feels really nice. I've never been too picky about saddles because I find that I get used to them pretty quickly. So for me, this one will do just fine. I really like that this one doesn't have a sharp nose on it. Anyone who has taken a saddle to the back of the leg knows what I'm talking about. Attached to that saddle is a 170mm KS Rage dropper on my size large frame. The travel on each frame size will be slightly different, but this thing is buttery smooth and well, it does what it's supposed to. We'll talk about this dropper a little bit more later. I'm not going to pretend that I know a lot about frame geometry, but if there's one thing that really stands out to me, it's the very slack front end. Accompanied by the Fox 38, you can plow through just about anything on this bike, while the front wheel is pushed way out leading the charge. This makes tackling just about any technical descent a breeze, and acts as a buffer from going OTB when landing nose heavy. The steep seat tube angle puts you more centered over your bike, which allows for a better climbing experience and more bike control when seated. Because I live in such a flat area, this was very important to me, as most of my riding is done from the saddle. This also adds a little bit more rear travel clearance for park laps and trips to those areas with a little bit more elevation. The four piston Shimano SLX brakes paired with the 203mm Ice Tech rotors will allow you to stop in even the steepest of conditions. I find that these brakes are very easy to modulate, and the rotors are still perfectly true after putting them to work up in Copper Harbor. This bike comes with the Shimano SLX group set, which I was very happy with at first. I was a big fan of the shifter, and the derailleur had a great response and was very easy to index. I also liked how clean the cockpit looked with the shifter mounted directly to the brake lever clamp. I've since swapped the shifter and derailleur out with the SRAM NX, and if you've seen my last video from my Copper Harbor trip, you know why. Oh, that did not sound good. No! Come on. Now that we're on the topic of having issues with components, let's circle back to something that we've already talked about. I mentioned earlier that the KS Rage dropper is buttery smooth, and so far it's been very reliable. But the issue that I've been having is with the clamp that holds the seat rails. No matter if it's torqued to spec, over-tightened, under-tightened, or even greased, the seat post still likes to chirp at you. For me, this isn't a deal breaker and I'll keep running this dropper post unless it continues to get louder, but it's something worth mentioning. The one thing that seems a bit odd to me is the choice to go with 170mm crank arms. The SLX cranks themselves have been great, but the choice to go with such a long arm on a bike with such a low bottom bracket seems a bit odd. An enduro rig is tailored to be a do-everything kind of bike that allows you to crush both the ups and the downs. But frequent pedal strikes tend to be very inhibiting. Even running 15% sag in the back, I find myself having at least a handful of pedal strikes on any given ride. While I do appreciate the extra leverage that these longer arms provide, it just isn't necessary with such a large range of gears in the back. I'll likely swap these up for something shorter in the future, which I'm sure will solve most of my pedal striking issues. Moving down to something that's actually supposed to be on the ground, the stock Maxxis tires aren't holding up as well as I would have hoped. 
I've always used Max's tires in the past, but I've actually never had very good luck with them. You came back off. I'm sure many of you will disagree, and I honestly don't blame you, as Minions tend to be the gold standard for tires. But after only a couple hundred miles, these tires are already falling apart. And given that most of my local riding is on some pretty soft, easy-going trails, I would attribute most of this wear to our trip to the Upper Peninsula. The side knobs are already starting to show signs of ripping off, and some pretty good chunks are already missing from the treads. I know rocks can put a beating on tires, but I would expect a little more life out of tires that only have six days worth of riding on rock surfaces. I also ripped the rear tire off the rim, which sure, that was my fault. Uh oh! But it did come off pretty easily. The DT Swiss rims have held up great, and so far they're still perfectly true. I did put a small dent in the back rim, but to be fair, I've dented almost every rim I've had. These rims did come tubeless ready, so I quickly made the conversion after setting the bike up. But I've since added a tube back to the rear tire, because when I ripped my tire off while trying to learn a roost, it actually took the rim tape off with it. I'll tape it back up this winter, but for now, I'll just be running a tube in the back. Outside of the big things like suspension, wheel set, and drivetrain, some of the smaller components like the stem, grips, and handlebars are Commonsell's in-house brand Ride Alpha. Lots of bike companies do this, and that's perfectly fine. I'm really happy with a lot of these, but the stem has given me a few issues so far. I really like the look of this stem, so I don't want to throw it into my spare parts bin just yet. But this thing doesn't like to grab onto the steer tube very well. Several times now, I've found that my bars are misaligned from my front wheel, even when properly torqued. Those are not straight. Even when slightly over tightened, the wheel is folded when doing an endo turn, which has resulted in me going oh, over the bars. The oh! I did turn my handlebars though. I really like both the look and the length of this stem, so I'm hoping to find a way to make it work. If you have any suggestions, let me know down in the comments. So far, the only upgrades I've made to this bike have either been cosmetic or done simply out of necessity due to some form of failure. I added these PNW loam grips because the stock grips that came on the bike were pretty hard and actually not that grippy at all. These loam grips have all the traction in the world and provide a nice bit of cushion that really helps with arm pump. I threw on this 1UP bash guard and chain guide combo because, well, this bike has a pretty low bottom bracket. And I really like the looks of a chain guide. Any modern one by drivetrain that is well maintained and set up properly should not need a chain guide. But, like I said, I really like the way that they look. Like I said earlier, I ditched the inner tubes right away, and will for sure be getting the rear tire sorted back out here shortly. I went with Muckoff Valve and Valve Cores, which came with a cap that has an integrated valve core removal tool. I've also added the All Mountain Style Frame Protection Kit in spots that I know I will damage the paint. I'm not too concerned with the usual nicks and dings, but I tend to rub my heels on the rear triangle while riding, and have worn the paint clean down to the aluminum on other bikes. Overall, this bike is absolutely amazing. Everything from the looks to the ride, this bike has me grinning ear to ear every time I swing my leg over it. I'm 5 foot 10 inches tall, or 178 centimeters for anyone outside the US, which puts me right in the middle of a medium and a large frame size. In the past, I've typically opted for a smaller frame size as they tend to be easier to throw around. After comparing the measurements and geometry to my previous trail bike, I decided to go with a size large and I'm very glad that I did. Even with the stretched out wheelbase and extra long travel, this bike is very playful and can be tossed around just as easily as any other full suspension bike out there. While I did have a few complaints about this bike, I really had to dig deep to come up with them, and most of these complaints could be found on just about any other bike. I've left a few links down in the description for everything from the bike itself to some of the bits and pieces that I've added. Some of these are just regular old links, while others are affiliate links where I get a little kickback for anything that you buy. If you choose to order anything through any of these links, just know that you're not being charged anything extra, I just get a little piece of the pie. If you're new here and you liked this video, please consider subscribing. We've got everything from trail dogs to build videos, and let me know what you think of the new logo.